Good afternoon and welcome to BitGardener's presentation of Color and Effects Measurements uh, and the Big Mac Eye. My name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here. And uh, also welcome to our new webinar platform. We're using ClickMeeting. Um, this is the first go, so there may be some technical issues. So be patient if we run into those. Um, but uh, we should uh, be smooth sailing here. Um, so one thing, I have a poll for you, a survey. Uh, while we're getting started here, um, if you don't mind answering, what's your knowledge level of color and effect measurement? This will help the presenters and us uh, for future presentations. Um, also, we are recording this webinar and um, ab right from uh, concluding the webinar, you'll receive a link uh, in your email that will have that uh, webinar recording link. Also, uh, we should have time following the presentation today for some questions and answers. Uh, so if you do have a question, um, please log that in the Q&A box located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and uh, we'll get to them in uh, order as they're entered. So uh, with that, let's see, looks like we have people entering their um, uh, poll in here. If you haven't already taken that, uh, go ahead and we'll get started. And let's see, looks like we have a few more people to take it. Um, today's presenters are Mr. Greg Schreider and Ms. Ray Roby. Uh, Ray is the business line manager for automotive and Greg is key account manager and business line manager for um, paint and coatings makers. Uh, so with that, um, I think Ray, I'm going to turn things over to you here and we will end the voting right now. Share the results with everybody. Should see. Um, Little more than half of the people voted and uh, we got 50% in. So um, thank you for your time there. And we'll turn it back over to the presentation and to Ray. Ray, it's all yours, ma'am. Don't forget to unmute yourself. You there, Ray? You able to unmute yourself? There you go, Ray. Thank I you. I am sorry, but it took a second because I had to think about it. <laughs> Again, a new format for us, so. Bear with us. Thank you. All right, so. Hopefully you can see my presentation, correct? Yes or no? Can you see it? Yes, Ray, we can see it. Okay, thank you, Geraldine. So, okay, basically, we didn't want to just talk about effect coatings without talking about color and how kind of color is important to the effect. So, we wanted to kind of go back and say, okay, you know, you have a light source, you have an observer, you have an object. This is also important. And there's a lot of stuff that happens when you look at coding. So, you know, obviously the gloss has an effect the absorption of the pigments, and then the dis diffusion of the pigments. So these are all like really big things that change how you perceive a color. <clears throat> and of course, 
they don't just happen one time, they happen all together. So this is just an example of everything happening at the same time. All right, so this is something that we do at customers. We talk about the spectral curves and spectral curves are really important because it really gives you an idea of what the color is. So in this example, the first one on the left top is blue. The second one is red. The third one on the bottom left side is green and the other one is yellow. So one thing you guys have to think about when your matching color is, do you need to look at the spectral curves? I mean, spectral curves are really a big deal and, you know, in my opinion, you can really match a color or not match a color based off the spectral curve. So it's really, really important. All right, so we talked about, sorry, it's a bit weird this way we are having to do it, but we talked about everything. So you have the spectral curve, you have the object, you have the illuminate, and everything has to come together. So originally it was XYZ, and now it's LAB. And LAB makes it easier for us to communicate color to each other. So for example, The LAB coordinates for this color are these for absolute. And I know that, you know, we really don't talk about things in absolute values. We talk about them in deltas, but we'll get there in a second. So just give me a little bit. The other The other thing is LCH. So it's important that you guys understand like if you have a chromatic color that it actually needs to be done in LCH coordinates because it's a totally different space. Okay. So what did we do? We take this delta measurement. So we have something that is a standard and we compare it to something. So this is an example. And this is delta E. So everybody who's probably on the call has many different ways that they measure stuff and do things. Um, we can always help with that and make it better. But for this example, it's delta E. So what happens is we make this delta E calculation. And guess what? Depending on where you, I don't like this. Depending on where you are in color space, you can have the same delta E value. And in this case, it's a delta E value of one. But if you look at sample one and sample two, these are very different. So I, in my mind, would not like sample two. And sample one would look pretty much okay but they have the same delta values. But the biggest point is here, where you see that this 1.0 
is all in the red, green, and in this case, red because it's positive, um, that that's a problem. And that's why when you look at sample two, it looks so different. The other thing you have to think about is like where you are in color space and it totally changes depending on where you are. So the newer equations take this into account. If you use older equations, you're going to have to physically do them by hand. And we're trying to make sure that that's not something that has to happen. So this is why we use like the DIN equation and other equations that we use. All right, so anywhere you are in color space is different. So if you look at all of these ellipses, um, basically the idea is that you see color a little bit differently depending on where you are in color space. So if you had to set up tolerances, say, for a red and you see how tight the tolerance is for the red, you would have to completely change how you set stuff up. And for a green, it would be different. And we've worked with OEMs and paint suppliers to try to figure out like what is actually the right way to define this stuff. So hopefully you don't have to do it anymore. And then for every color system, there's a non-chromatic and a chromatic um, idea of what they think. So for this system, this is what is defined as chromatic and non-chromatic. I mean, obviously we could change that, but this is where we are. Okay, so this is just an idea of what happens with Delta E CMC or C lab tolerancy. Okay, so the circle kind of fits, you know, what we think would be acceptable. And the square is what the C lab tolerances would do. So it's not so bad. I mean, maybe you got like three things that you know, visually aren't acceptable, but actually like get shipped. Now, if we go to here, it's a totally different story. So technically I should have an ellipse, which we talked about before, but you know, if I use a C-Lab tolerancing, either I ship a bunch of product that is horrible or I ship a bunch of product that technically could be cool. So it's really important that we think about like the tolerancing to make sure that it's correct for what we were trying to do for our system and that's why we've worked on 
new technology or new equations to make sure that we can do this better. So this is one idea that we came up with is doing a different tolerancing on the LCH. Um, I would say that we have way better equations that we can use now. And I think that that would be probably better. All right, so how does the instrument measure? So basically we measure with a light source. Do I need to use a pointer or can you see it? Anyway, we use a light source here and it reflects back here. And then we have detectors at the 15 or minus 15, 15, 25, 75, and 110, and 45. And then we do the sparkle and greeniness. And there's a camera in the middle. And basically we illuminate at the 15, the 75, and the 45. And these just... To make sure that we're clear, they're not the same angles as what we do for the color measurement. So just be careful when you look at it. Okay, so I think it's time for a pull. Pull, whatever you say. That was the old one. Here's the new poll. What is the importance of using color and effect measurement for process control, harmony, or meeting a specification? What's your best answer? Uh, please vote now. Coming in here, got about a third. Give it another 30 seconds or so. And then Ray, are you finishing after this or are we switching over to Greg? It's Greg after me. Okay. Oh, we're about even here so far. Let's give it another 15 seconds or so. Okay, I'm going to end the voting here. And you can see the results here. It's pretty even. Greg or Ray, any comment on the results while I flip to the uh, presentation. And they should have been even. Well, good. Because all of those things are important. Ah, trick poll. So Greg is going to maybe talk a bit, but I mean, to me, you know, all those things are important. I mean, you want harmony, you want to meet your specification, you want all those things. So that's a big deal. And Greg's gonna give you a little bit more information on Sparkle. And Sparkle to me, I feel like um, it's something that we don't, always think about, but it's very important. 
Greg, Greg, so you go. All right, Greg, thanks. It's all yours, sir. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So one, one of the things that we look at is the color at different angles, but we also want to look at the effect at different angles and, and quantify that, just how we are visually seeing something. And to do that, we are going to look at things under two different conditions, one that's going to correlate to a sunny day and one that's going to correlate to a cloudy day. So the appearance of effect colors can vary under different conditions. And the direct illumination is, again, a sunny sky. And that's when the effect pigment uh, sparkles or comes alive. Um, and in many cases, we want to evaluate that at multiple angles so that we have good harmony in all different positions of um, car positions. And cloudy sky is a diffuse illumination, and that is where we're going to see this grainy pattern. So a few things to note about visual evaluation under direct illumination is that it's critical that you track the observation angle. It, the sparkle uh, differences will, will change with the different observation angles, um, and that is due to the different types of pigments that are in a given coating. So you could have aluminum flake, you could have mica or xerelic, and those different pigments have different um, impact on sparkle. Uh, the, the amount of the pigment is also going to have an impact on sparkle, as well as the size of the flake. And there's different terminologies that are used in the industry. Uh, besides sparkle, you might hear micro brightness, glints, or even diamonds. Now, graininess is, again, that diffuse illumination or the cloudy sky. And this is forwarded to an automatic voice message. This is not um, going to vary by observation angle. So graininess is going to look pretty much the same at all the different angles. Um, but it is difficult to see graininess from a distance. So sparkle you can see from pretty far away, um, but graininess is something that you can only observe up close, uh, roughly arm's length away. Different things that will impact graininess would be flake type, flake size, uh, certainly orientation of flakes, uh, could affect the graininess as well as agglomeration of particles. So a little bit of background on how these sparkle and greenness values were developed. Um, in the original work that we did with Axo Nobel and Merck, Axo was in charge of doing a visual study and they, they built a room for the diffuse evaluations and they painted all the walls white and they had a diffuser in the ceiling so unlike a light booth where it's gray this is a, a white room so you get good diffuse illumination what they did next is they had eight defined anchor panels so these are eight different silver panels that are visually spaced equally. So they lined up all those eight panels and then they took, uh, they actually had over 300 colors, refinished colors that they used in the, in the set. And they evaluated each one of those colors against that anchor panel set of eight panels. And they were allowed to say it's a, a one or a two or it's a three or a four or it could be a three and a half. So they did that um, with seven different observers, actually. And then they set up a spotlight and did the same evaluation of all those colors against the anchor panel set for three different angles. So that would be the direct illumination. 
and then they compared all of the uh, coarseness or graininess values to all of the glint or sparkle values. And they're, what they found out is that these two parameters were independent of each other. Uh, so that's to say that you, just because you have a lot of coarseness doesn't mean that you have automatically a lot of sparkle. So you could have high coarseness or graininess values, um, and you could have very low sparkle values. So they're independent of each other. What they did, then they looked at all of the different values that were determined, and they had anywhere from a 91 to 96% correlation. And that's to say that 91 to 96% of the time, all seven observers chose the exact same answer for sparkle or graininess. What they also found out is that the average observer can see roughly a half a unit, 0.55 was the average, and that um, that one unit of coarseness or sparkle was acceptable. The one thing that they wanted more information about is how not only how um, how much sparkle there was, but how much intensity there was with that sparkle. So there's some addi additional work done on that. And um, it's important to remember that when we're measuring color measurement, we're actually integrating in also any sparkle that happens to be at that particular angle. So there, there's oftentimes where there is disagreement in the color measurements because the differences that were being seen were in sparkle or graininess only. And that it's important to look at the sparkle values for characterizing different pigments. And a lot of times um, in trying to simulate a color, the sparkle values are, are very critical to uh, actually choosing the right type of pigment. So the goal was to have multi-angle color measurement as well as some type of a flake characterization tool. And that's what led to the development of the, the BitMac uh, technology. Now, it's also important to know what the technology is not capable of. And it's not meant to be an analytical um, tool. It's not to replace the work that's done through a microscope or some type of other imaging system to do more of a flake characterization or determine the type of flake that's in a particular coating. So again, this is the optical setup for the sp sparkle measurements illumination at 15, 45, and 75. And then at the normal axis, we have the CCD camera, which is picking up that those three different images. And then this hemisphere represents the uh, two hemispheres that are in the Big Mac that diffusely illuminate the sample. And then we pick up a fourth image for the grainish measurement. This just gives you an idea of um, a sample image of the 15 degrees sparkle. Uh, these two panels are the same um, type of pigment. The first panel is a 40-60 blend, and the second panel is a 60-40 blend. So it's the same uh, two pigments, just different concentrations of each. and it may be difficult to see, um, but you can see that the the second panel does have a little bit more sparkle to it, and um, graininess is, is very similar in this particular case. So when we analyze those black and white images, we are then going to uh, calculate a value that's going to represent the sparkle area and we're gonna 
calculate a value that is going to represent the sparkle intensity. So intensity is just when you see that flash, how how much of a uh, brightness do you actually see? And then area is more how many times do I see it? So compliments of Eckert, a uh, sister company of ours. Um, these are four different types of pigments where we have the conventional cornflake. You can see it's uh, rougher on the edges. Then you go to the non-degradable flake, which is a thicker, um, more durable type of pigment. And then you have silver dollar, which is very similar, but very much thinner, uh, still in that um, traditional silver dollar pattern. And then you have the vapor deposition type of pigments that are very, very thin. And so those type, different types of pigments are going to give you different types of brightness. Uh, they're going to impact your sparkle. Um, they're also going to impact the flop or the color travel of a particular color. And they will also impact the coverage or opacity. Now, in most cases, as you increase from a fine pigment to a very coarse pigment, your brightness increases, your sparkle increases, and the flop or contrast will be greater. But con contrasting that is the op you lose opacity. So a lot of times it's, it's a blend of multiple pigments to get the best of all uh, properties that you're looking to maintain. So we also talk about uh, the, the pigment ori orientation and how that affects the travel or the flop characteristics of a given coating. And here we have two, two examples where one, we have very good alignment and orientation is, is very uniform. And then in another sample where the orientation is, is varied. And in this case, you can see that we have good reflectivity all going in one direction of the good orientated sample, where when you have poor orientation, you're going to have that reflection going in different directions. And that's going to decrease the travel. It's going to decrease the flop. Um, it's probably going to increase the graininess a little bit. And um, where on the good orientation um, sample, you're going to have really strong flop and you're going to have high brilliancy um, and it's going to look overall much more uniform. So here's a video. Um, and what we're going to see is how orientation affects um, the flop characteristics of the given sample. So in order to simulate this, again, compliments of Eckert, uh, you're going to see this film put down very, very wet, and it's going to take a longer uh, cure time, and you're going to see that the flake um, does not orientate itself uh, well in that particular sample. The next is going to be um, an optimum simulation, and you'll see that the cure time is less, and you get really good orientation of the flake in the paint layer. Again, that's going to lead to a higher flop and more brilliancy of the sample. And the last simulation is going to be a dry application where it's going to, cure time is going to be even less. And you can see the orientation is poor. And in some cases, actually, maybe the flake penetrating through the surface. Then we'll show all three side by side. This gives you a, a good appreciation for the film build. And again, there's, a, there's an optimum film build that you're trying to uh, achieve that gives you not only good film build, but good orientation of the flake. The next part of this video, you're going to see the panels themselves um, that have been sprayed out, and they're going to flop, uh, go through the, and you'll see the, 
center one has the deepest black or the highest flop and the brightest flash when it gets rotated through. So, here's a, a microscope image of good orientation versus poor orientation. And you can see right away that the poor orientation has these voids where they're where it's dark and um, you still have some bright spots here so the the flake itself is is visible but these dark voids are going to decrease that overall travel and the overall um, amount of travel that, or flop that you get with that particular panel where these are going to be very very bright and they're very uniform um, so you're color is going to look very consistent um whereas over here you've got some inconsistencies or dark dark spots so we mentioned that the tolerance model um has a similar shape of a tolerance to that of cmc color difference and there's two axes that can be controlled um, to determine the size of the ellipse. The shape will change depending upon where you are in sparkle space. For example, if you are have a lot of area, the, the ellipse is going to lay along this axis. But if you have a lot of area, then your eye becomes more sensitive to the intensity changes. Whereas if you have um, a lot of intensity, this ellipse will be standing standing on edge, and then your eye becomes more sensitive to the amount or area uh, factor of the ellipse. So we just call that the grade factor is the purple axis, and the black axis is the tolerance grade. So... I mean, just from a perspective of what the OEMs do, I mean, most of them do not change these except for really, really specific colors. So, like, if you have, like, something that looks like, you know, a bass boat, I mean, I think this is what Craig has talked about before. Yeah, then it changes. But this is the basic... Tolerances we do three to one. I mean, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I can continue going through this. This is just to demonstrate the um, differences in tolerances between this first one and second one. Uh, the same ratio for axis, but the tolerance is double for the one in the center compared to the one on the left. And as Ray said, the current kind of default tolerance, if you will, for the industry is one to three um, with a tolerance factor of one. Which is the one on the, you know, the right. right side. Yep. Because that's the most that, I mean, it's not that it's not, it's, it's, it's really good, but it's not perfect. So we always have to adjust, right, for certain colors. So you always have to think about that. Oops, I think I skipped a slide. So this is just the graininess tolerance. Um, it's a one-dimensional value, uh, 0 to 15. 0 would be a solid color. There would be no graininess on a solid color to something that would be very, very grainy. And again, these 15 different steps, if you will, correlate to the anchor panel set that was used to develop the visual study to begin with. Um, so essentially, um, it's 15 because they could they could say it was a three and a half or a four and a half or a five and a half. So that gives you the in, the the 15 different steps. Now, what's really important to remember is that uh, 
I mentioned earlier that we can see perceptibility of about a half a unit in sparkle and graininess, but acceptability is around one. Um, again, that's kind of a default. It, it can de depend upon the actual color, um, but in general, we want to use both the color measurement and the sparkle measurement to determine if something is visually acceptable. So if you looked at just the color values for two samples, these two samples, coarse gray and um, coarse and fine, uh, a dark gray that has coarse and fine pigments in it, the, the color measurements would be pretty good. But we see that there's big sparkle differences. Um, certainly in the 15 with six units of sparkle difference. That's, you know, 12 times what is perceptible. Um, even at the 45 or, or 75, you've got almost a, a whole unit of sparkle difference. And then three and a half units on graininess, which would be night and day. Um, and if you actually have seen these two panels in any of our... Um, in-person meetings, they are very, very different panels. Now, the evaluation and the ability to define a sparkle specification um, is, is important. And in the original development, uh, BMW approached us and wanted to be able to specify or determine if a Zarelic pigment was used to achieve one of their new colors. And what we see here is they, they did a step ladder of um, from 0.3 to 2% Zarelic, and then they did the same with 0.3 to 2% mica. And you can see that um, as you increase the amount of Zarelic pigment, you get these stair steps of improved sparkle. Um, as you put more and more pigment into the sample. And with mica, you don't improve the intensity um, at all. You, you're just basically adding more and more area um, to the particular sparkle measurements. So that was see seen as a very positive thing where you could look at two samples and determine uh, if, if a particular pigment was used to get a, a high degree of sparkle. And this, this is just an example of a red with mica and xarelic in it. Again, the color measurements are pretty good. Um, they're pretty close to one another and at the, at the five different angles. But when I look at the sparkle differences, there's two units of sparkle difference between those two samples. And then, um, so that's two different sample with 0.3% Zarelic and 0.3% mica. And then if we add, if we put in 0.75% mica, you can see here it just changes and takes it out in sparkle area. It doesn't improve the intensity at all. And then if I look at the color measurement as I add that much more mica, it really takes me off and changes the color dramatically. Um, so you can see where at the 15, it's most greatly impacted, um, taking it out in the positive A direction, nine units, and in the positive B direction, about six units or so. And then it, same, same similar pattern for 25 and 45, and least affected would be your flop angles. Um, where you're not going to see the effect of that mica on the flop angles. So this is just kind of a summary slide of um, what we see when we look at color. We, we don't see the individual pigments that are in a given formula. You just see the solid color background. And then we also see sparkles separately from coarseness.
and it's it's supposed to be animated and I'm not sure why it's it's supposed to go through um, we'll have to work on that and this is a summary slide for where we would kind of fo first focus on if we looked at sparkle and grayness differences. So the 15 degree sparkle, more or less sparkling, usually is a, points us in the direction of the type of pigment that's being used. Um, if we're increasing the sparkle area, then um, we look at the pigment loading is usually something that would um, cause the area to increase. And again, the intensity would probably stay the same. Um, and then if we saw in differences in intensity, then we look for different types of pigment being used. And so typically the smaller um, flakes are less sparkly, if you will, than the coarser um, or the bigger flakes. And then the different types of pigments have different types of sparkle uh, characteristics to them. And sometimes if you, if you have, just think of edge effects from the pigment. If you have a two silver dollars, one's a thick silver dollar and the other's a thin one, the thicker one's going to have more edge effect, um, more diffusion of light off the edge, and it's going to affect your, your sparkle. On the 75, we really look at this as an application indicator. So again, if you have good orientated flake in your pigment layer on the on the 75 or the flop angles you're going to get that strong color flop um, and if you have some flake that's disorientated uh, on the color flop or on the flop of the sample or the car you're going to get sparkle coming back at you and and that's not desired um, things that can lead to that are either spraying something too dry or too wet again referring back to the eckert film uh, if you have two different types of applications that you know maybe you you have a bell bell uh, application in a plant and then you have an add-on part that went through a bell uh, pneumatic out uh, application it could have different flake orientation just due to the application itself and then over spray obviously you would you'd have um, that would affect your your sparkle on the 75. So in summary, the Big Mac technology contains the color measurement, the integrated color measurement at six different angles, including the minus 15, which is a, uh, was an angle that was added to primarily control interference, uh, colors that have interference pigments in them because you get kind of a hue shift. And then we also have the three angles for sparkle characterization. Again, different angles in the color, but uh, 15, 45, and 75. And the camera detection is always uh, at the perpendicular or normal axis. Uh, and then we have the diffuse illumination for graininess. Excellent. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Greg. Um, great information. And uh, we do have a few questions here. Um, also, if you do have a question, uh, please log them in the Q&A box located in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, the first one, uh, how can measuring metallics help identify what effect pigment is being used? So a lot of times, um, the, the people who are formulating will pay much more attention to the 15 degree sparkle information, as well as the color information to determine what pigments and, and choices they should use for the different types of effect pigments. Okay. Uh, next question here. How uh, is the Big Mac handling flip pigments? Uh, John, did you say flip pigment? I did. That's what's written here. 
Is that right? Let me find them. I'm not uh, sure what? of the term. Wahid, I'm going to, I just unlocked your microphone so you can unmute yourself. Were you referring to flop, Pignet? Or is this a, a typo? I see him on there. It could be referring to flop pigments, Greg. How does it handle flop pigments? So any, I think uh, if it's a hue shifting pigment, um, which would change color by angle, then the minus 15 angle is going to be very, very important. If you, if you measure, um, if you have one interference pigment in a, in a coating and you just have a straight um, one pigment and you look at those different curves, you'll see the curve shape will be the same, but it will be moving to the right. And that's how you get the hue shift for that pigment. Okay. Is the unit design, next question um, from Wahid again, is this unit designed to measure all flakes, Michael and flop pigments or all the above? It's, it's designed to measure how we see color. So at each of the angles, we're going to be looking at the color integrated color measurement, but in addition, we're separating out the sparkle and graininess to say how do those color values and the sparkle values look in direct illumination or diffuse illumination, and that's just how we're, we're characterizing what you see. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kumar, you're next here. Uh, thank you for your questions. First one, will you share this presentation? It should be attached in the automated uh, email that goes out once we conclude. I know it will contain the um, uh, link to the recording. It should also contain the presentation. If for some reason it doesn't, we'll, we'll make sure uh, that goes out. Uh, and then your other question here. Uh, from your experience, which are the colors with metallic flop more? Which are the colors that colors with metallic flop more? So I would I would say that your colors that contain um, a lot of silver pigment in them are going to travel more than other colors. Uh, that have more absorption pigments in them. So like a red or a blue, uh, just to contrast against a, a silver. And then the types of flake, um, the ones that are thinner are going to have a stronger flop than uh, like a cornflake or, um, or silver dollar that's thicker. Okay. Um, Miguel, thank you for your, your comment. Um, this first first one, you know, what little bumps to, to smooth out, but we'll, we'll get better as we use this new tool. But uh, thank you, glad, glad it was, uh, um, it helped you here. Um, another question, uh, how can I use the Big Mac um, to help with formulation? So, there has been some work done by different companies where they've gone and they've done these concentration ladders for different pigments. And they look at how much sparkle intensity they can, how those ladders impact sparkle intensity in the area, basically. And um, the intensity is going to be more affected by the type of pigment where the area is more affected by how much of that pigment is in a given formula. Um, that's kind of a starting point to help see where you are in sparkle space in addition to color. Okay. That's good. Any other questions out there? Um, please log them in. We have 
Uh, just a couple minutes left here. Greg, can you talk a little bit more about how customers can um, create a metallic, a, a database of all of their effect pigments? And um, if they measure them with the Big Mac, they can often use the, the database to help them decide which pigments have the best flop and which one's combination might help them get to where they need to be? And how would they do that? Sure. Um, so if, if you make these different ladders of concentration of pigment and you combine them with different colors, you can kind of see um, visually how you can cover certain areas of color space. If, if you wanted to use a database to do that, you could do it kind of the old fashioned way and just make a bunch of different formulas and, and do visual comparisons. Um, we do have software that will formulate for effect pigments. And in that case, uh, similar to building a ladder, we give you instruction on how to let the different pigments down with combinations of white, black, and uh, different effect pigments. And then we measure those in and we calculate uh, basically absorption and scatter values for all the different wavelengths. And then the software uses all that information to measure uh, an unknown and then come up with the formula. Uh, there's different ways to do that. Um, and in, in our software, you have to tell the software whether you're formulating a solid color, a color with metallic flake or, um, or mica. And then if you are also um, trying to formulate a color that's a tricoat, so where your tinted, your clear is tinted, or has pigment in the in the clear coat, you have to tell the, the system that you're going to work with that kind of a, a color because there's different mathematics that are going on in the background for the different layers uh, that the instrument measures when you measure color. Okay. Okay, I think that... Uh... Answers everyone's question here. Oh, just got another one in here. Thank you, Kumar. Um, just in the nick of time. Uh, do we have to always use all six angles to read colors, or can we skip some angles um, depending on the product and part orientation? So, recommendation is if you have anything that's um, a color shifting color, use all six. Um, if it doesn't shift, if it doesn't have a hue shift, like a, a, a mica in it, or uh, you can turn off the minus 15 angle. Um, some people th will work with the three angles. They'll choose three angles. Um, if you're gonna do that, we would suggest 15, 45, and 110 because it gives you the greatest coverage of you know, looking at how that color is gonna travel. But there's certainly, uh, you know, there are shortcuts that you can take. Uh, but from our experience, even if you measure it and don't tolerance it, at least you have that information if you need to go back and dig into the data uh, at some later point in time. So you can set up different tolerancing schemes to tolerance all six angles or all three sparkle angles and graininess, or you don't have to tolerance all of those at the same time if you don't want to. I'll just add to that a little bit, Greg. Um, what I usually tell customers is to measure everything you can until you determine that it doesn't matter. So measure, um, keep everything on, and when you find that um, a particular angle has no influence on what you are using for your application, go ahead and turn that off. The nice thing about the Big Mac and Smart Chart software is it is always measuring everything. And it's all about what you wanna see. So if you determine in six months 
that you felt though you made a mistake and maybe this particular angle is now important, you can just turn it back on in the software and the data will always be there. Yeah, that's a great point. It's always good to measure everything you can and then you know, just for that instance, if you need to go back, turn things back on. Exactly, if the data is not telling you what you see, then you're not collecting enough data. So just turn on more angles as you need to. Thank you, Jerilyn, for chiming in. Um, thank you, Ray and Greg. And thank you for all our attendees. A lot of great questions today. Um, thanks for uh, being the guinea pigs on this um, new web seminar platform. We appreciate it. And uh, um, yeah, take note of future invites for future webinars. And also, um, you'll receive um, uh, the presentation and uh, the link to the recording. Um, uh, after we conclude. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please reach out to um, your local uh, field representative, um, any of the presenters, Greg or Ray, or um, any of the emails you receive from marketing, you can just hit reply and, and we'll get it to the, the right technical experts. Uh, so with that, thank you for your attendance. Glad to have you here and have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>